Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Alessio. Hello. Audrey. Hi everyone. And I'm your host, Fen. We're going to be talking today about a few games that are all excellent options for one or two players, with a couple of them having space to play with more. If, you know, you happen to be able to too many bones, we're going to look at Micro Macro Crime City, One Deck Dungeon, and finally end it with the solo game Hostage Negotiator. But before we get into all of that, we're going to start with the standee catch-up. So it's been a little while. What have you been up to, Alessio? Oh, well, it's actually been a while. <laughs> so, um... I was, that's great, because I'm currently being overworked, but I managed to snatch a couple of games. For example, on vacation, with the family, but with the kids asleep, I have to say that. <laughs> I played a lot of, of The Crew Mission uh, Deep Sea, and well, there's a lot of it. Also, uh, I, I decided that uh, Secret Hitler is, uh, is a party game so good that it deserved just uh, to not have the print and play. I bought the actual uh, physical copy of the game. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> that... <laughs> I, I know it is. I keep buying it up, um, but I really want to get the, um, the Cthulhu-themed version. But that's in the UK. They print it, so there's the import costs and everything. So I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I actually had to pay like uh, 10 euros totals of uh, import costs. So 10 euros totals of uh, import costs. So that was pretty affordable. Uh, it has wooden placards and uh, silver and gold trimmings, so <laughs> it's exceptional. <laughs> it's very beautiful. It's luxury. It's luxury. Now, uh, of course, I, I have Fancy. to find. Fancy. Yeah, yeah. I... Now, uh, of course, I, I have Fancy. to find. Fancy. Yeah, yeah. I have to find like five to ten people to play with. It with. <laughs> Never used that... to be a problem back in the day, but uh, <laughs> at the, right now. Yeah, obstacles. Could, 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 have, could have a few issues. Anyway, everyone is green passed because I also completed the COVID. Anyway, everyone is green passed because I also completed the COVID vac vaccine, vaccine, vac vac vaccinated, vac something. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to spell vaccine. Vaccine. Shots. Vaccine, vaccination. Vaccine. Okay, vaccination. I knew. I didn't know if vaccine or vaccine. Vaccine. That, that, that's bubbling a lot for me. So what have you been up to, Audrey? Uh, same as you. Uh, lots of holiday time with my parents, with my sister uh, a bit. So we didn't play a lot we did play for and uh, with my grandmother as well uh, the good old uh, classic card game um, with uh, my sister we did it as well because it's a four people so mother father myself and then either my sister or my grandmother uh, my sister lent uh, lent us uh, her copy of micro macro crime city that we're going to mention uh, just after so we played it with my parents she wasn't there uh, at the, as this was the early days of the holidays and then with my parents we also played uh, the game then with my parents we also played uh, the game that I got them for Father's and Mother's Day which is Codex Naturalis and as always they had messed up something in the rules and I had to correct it <laughs> so you, you know you know, co Codex Naturalis, it's uh, a lot cool. You know, co Codex Naturalis, it's uh, a lot cool. You, you can cover uh, the rules. It's, it's great. You can cover cards. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it it was fun, but we had to explain my dad, I think, f at least five times that if there isn't <laughs> a corner on your card, you cannot put it, you can card, you cannot put it, you cannot put another card on it, even if it does have a corner. No, 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 you put no corner on a corner, but you can't put a corner on no corner. Woo! That was complicated, but uh, after a while he, he, he understood and we and it, and it was fine. I think my boy understood and we and it, and it was fine. I think my boyfriend won. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. It it sounds like uh, sure, like like you have been uh, at home like for two days. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 and oh, I, I, I did a, I did a, I, I mean, it's not really a board game, but I did a biking session with my parents, and I can say that electrical bikes are fun, and, and that's all for me, uh, fun, do you have anything to say about your time? Oh, well, yeah, um, currently, oh, but it's been repainted now, and we have to sort out all the, um, all the furniture the birds are moving in there because they not very happy where they are right now um i had a chance to play quite a few board games because we live on gotland so that's sweden's holiday destination which means all the family come over we got to play we play castell um which is a there's, there'll be a review from me out on board game geek uh, by the time this podcast goes live that's about uh, building castells, human towers in Catalonia. It's a really fantastic game. Um, super interesting. I've heard and of... really fantastic game. Um, super interesting. I've heard and a then... lot of good of, uh, about it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it. Not only is it an interesting sporting Euro, but the theme is just absolutely integral to the gameplay, and it, it shows a lot of. A lot of respect integral to the gameplay and it shows a lot of a lot of respect um it's by an american who lives in germany his name's aaron i can't remember his surname right now i want to is i want to say beck but that may be his username on board game geek um but he is um but he is his first ever design and it's fantastic um and we also played meeple circus as well which is again building towers but dexterity based with lots yeah, of fun. Meeple, Meeple Circus is fun. <laughs> yeah, it it is a lot of fun. Um, it absolutely uh, <laughs> the one handed version, and you could see his 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 other hand kept trying to creep in and uh, to get involved until I told him, stick it under the table, stop it. <laughs> yeah, and try to stack that kind of camel Meeple. Cuff yourself to the table. Yep. Yep. Um, and also t- from the designer of Castell, I think I might be talking about that in the next podcast. It is a drag race inspired lip sync competition game for two to four players. That sounds really interesting. I've uh, I've also been uh, looking at it for a while, so I I think that seems like a fun game. Yeah, I I think that seems like a fun game. Yeah, I I contacted Aaron over Board Game Geek. He was really nice. He said, here's the rules. I've just updated the mod, so I'm going to play it tonight with a bunch of huge Drag Race fans. Um, I'm just a a passive watcher and critic of when it comes to Drag Race. (laughs) Um, I'm just a passive watcher and critic of when it comes to Drag Race. (laughs) Um, And then uh, we played a bit of Dream Crush, which is every bit as amazing as you can imagine it is, but you do want a large group of people and some coffee traders, which I might talk about in the future. It's a really heavy, crunchy Euro. So that's been a really heavy, crunchy Euro. So that's been um, great. I forgot something. Yeah, I'm planning my wedding for the uh, Christmas holidays. And I said to my step family, who is taking care of all the decorations, that I wanted meeple shaped stuff. You'll have to send. But uh, it's in theme of the podcast. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Another wedding. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, that's that's you know, congratulations again. And that's going to. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. That's a fun theme for a wedding, definitely. No, no it's not the theme of the wedding. I just want some meeples. Sub theme? The tables. <laughs> you use the meeples to make the tableau. <laughs> and um, Alexis? Yeah. Uh, on my end, not too many board games. Uh, the best thing that happened to me in the past uh, weekish is that I got a, de- a dehydrator and I've started making my own beef jerky and it's absolutely delicious. Uh, a little homemade beef jerky. Outside of that, I've not played that many things, um, but uh, I've been sinking a lot of hours recently into a game that I think is very board game related. It's uh, Wilder Myth. Uh, they just popped up a new update and I, I decided to go back into it. And it's some like games or narrative driven RPG, uh, roguelike RPGs should um, have a look at it because it is such a fun game um 
since we're not a, a video game podcast, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but it's it's just this really during the, the story will have uh, things that happen on your character and through the stories, they're going to grow and, and gain new power because of what happens. So for example, if you flee a combat, your character might uh, get hurt in the during the, the wave. They might lose a limb or something, but in wrong, it's usually going to be... Um, to give them a different use. For example, if you have a character that loses a, an arm, uh, they might have a, a hook arm instead. And so they can't use two-handed weapons, but they now have this new attack that can blind targets by using the, the hook. Little ways that make your character interesting. Like during a quest, you might gain wings, and through the story later, you might start turning into a weird hybrid crow or something. It's, it's a really good game. And uh, also in two days, a game that I've been waiting for seven years comes out. So I'm really excited. It's called 12 Minutes and it's a story about a 12 minute time loop. And it's voiced by Willem Dafoe. Uh, it's probably going to be one of the best game of the year. So I'm really excited about it. Outside of that, not too much. Uh, except that I've been uh, putting some a uh, couple of hours back into Too Many Bones after playing with uh, couple of hours back into Too Many Bones after playing with Fen and playing a uh, one game, uh, one solo game myself. Uh, so I can talk about that. Um, unless someone... Like right to... now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, do it! <laughs> yeah. Let's um, jump into please, the topic Please, please, then. then. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, do it! <laughs> yeah. Let's um, jump into please, the topic uh, please, then. then. That, that <laughs> does mean it's time to get the main topics rolling, so take it away. Yeah, um... Well, I, I I know that you were really into Wilder Myth 2 fan. I think uh, I think that I saw it. I saw you mention it at one point. It's my it, I rated it as my game of the year of 2020 when it came out in beta. Yeah, well, it, it definitely so. deserved it. So, but but I figured it, it was, there was there was a break in the flow of the podcast. <laughs> it was time to move on. So we yes. can just just. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, you know, as I was going to say, it's time to get the main topics rolling with a look at Too Many Bones, so take it away. Uh, Too Many Bones is a game by Chip Terry uh, that came out in 2017, and it's been very popular in the... Um, I want I want to to say the uh, more expensive sides of gaming. Like, I, it, it's, it was pretty popular alongside um, Kingdom Death, uh, what's the name? Um, Gloomhaven. I, I, it, it kind of, uh, it, it's kind of the, on the lower end of that that range of games. Um, and it had a few expansions since then. Uh, the game mixes different mechanics, but I would say it's core focus. Uh, the game mixes different mechanics, but I would say it's core focus. It's die dice pool building. Um, so the way it plays, Too Many Bones is divided into two phases. First, you have the map phase, where your player will draw adventure cards that will have a little story in it from a deck that will describe a step in their little story in it from a deck that will describe a step in their journey and give them two options. Uh, some of them leading to battles, others leading to little mini games, and usually you have different rewards for the two options and the players will together decide to uh, which option to pick. Uh, the second phase of combat uh, on a grid of 4x4, four four, where the players will maneuver around enemies and use their skills to defeat them. Uh, those skills are the most important features of the game. Each character comes with a neoprene mat with indents that represent their skills, and when they gain skill points, they'll pick dice that will fit those intents. And each and the game is all about setting up combos with those dice. So for example, you might have a die that will pull enemies towards you, another one that will uh, allow you to shoot multiple enemies, another one that will, uh, I don't know, power up your uh, rigged up mechanical drone. Um, every character is very, is very interesting. Uh, as with most uh, chip theory game, uh, the physical component of the game are really stellar. Um, they have thick, heavy poker ships that represent the players, the minion, and their enemies, uh, as well as their life points. The dice are very sharply cut, and they have life points. The dice are very sharply cut, and they have nice iconography. The mats all have that disgusting neoprene stench, but otherwise they are thick and well printed. <laughs> 
Um, it's a very big box that comes at around 150 euros with 10 also buses to 150 euros with 10 also buses to fight. And in my opinion, that's where the game kind of lacks a little bit. Um, I enjoyed the gameplay a lot, but I think that it suffers from a little bit of a lack of content. The base game comes with only four characters and the two fights uh, don't really change the gameplay that's, that much as they offer a lot of um, just different pools of enemies uh, and then they own boss fights. Um, and also you'll encounter the same adventure card again and again. And so I've heard a lot of good from some of the, uh, specifically Undertow, and I think that there was another one that's just uh, makes the start of the game a lot more interesting and diverse and adds uh, new types of monsters. And I think that if you have a couple of new characters and one expansion, the game uh, really benefits. Many Bones is, is actually uh, a lot of fun, very engaging, and the, the way that the, uh, the skill and dice system functions is pretty nice. Uh, and I played it with Fen recently, um, and I know that Fen played uh, Undertow, which is the, the specifically uh, two-player expansion. Undertow, which is the, the specifically uh, two-player expansion. Um, yeah. 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 So I have, I have the main game with too many bones. I have the Lab Rats characters, which is four separate gear locks in one. They all have their own separate tiny little grid um, and gasket. But yeah, Undertow takes place in a separate tiny little grid um, and gasket but yeah undertow takes place after the story of too many bones i don't know if you've recall or played against her but duster is one of the tyrants in too many bones and she's a gear lock um she's kind of like not actually that bad and she's bad and she feels like she's been framed and set up so undertow's like plotting is stanza and um duster going together up the river uh, looking to clear um, clear Duster's name and find out what's going on with the council. It has, uh, we'll fight either on a raft or on land. In the raft, there's these unique water enemies that crop up on the side. On land, there's these unique mechs. There's uh, also a lot more added to it in that there's obstacles to smash, um, mini objectives during fights, and uh, there's a whole campaign play a few of the standalone tyrants um because i've not had undertow for a super long time unfortunately it arrived like a few weeks ago um duster's very interesting she's an assassin with a pet and unlike what's his name the um what's his name the um gilly unlike gilly um duster's pet actually goes on the board and has a yeah, it is. Um, it's, I think her name's Nightshade, and she's like a pink tiger. And then Stanza is a bard um, with one of my favourite five cost bones plans. Um, with one of my favourite five cost bones plans, which are basically when you roll a bones, the name, which is a result on the dice from the name Too Many Bones, you can add it to your little bones like backup plan, I think it's called. Um, and Stanza's top one is that she smashes her loot over someone and loses all and loses all of her ability to play for the loot for the rest of the fight because she's broken it and needs to fix it, but deals a ton of damage. It's uh, it's quite fun. Um, Undertow's designed for two players, but will play more if you add expansion characters in or you have the main game. Um, from Sea of Blood from Descent, in that there's a central piece head and then a bunch of roving extra tentacles to, to deal with uh there's also yeah it's pretty fun um there's also an automaton boss who belongs to another character and there's a really cool wrinkle with that that i'm not going to give away here because you get too many bones i think undertow despite being slightly more complex might be the best place to start because it's a lower price point and it's got more going on it's it's more complex but in a good way yeah i that's also what I've heard, and from having played only too many bones, I can say that definitely, I wouldn't react on its own. Um, it has too many little gripes that I have with it. I think it's fun, but for 150 euros, I would expect more than fun. 
I think that I played it once with Audrey. Uh, but, yes, uh, and didn't I didn't really... like yeah. the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, and didn't I didn't really... like yeah. the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like the. Uh, I, I, it's been two years and a lot has happened since then, so my memory might be a bit fuzzy, honestly. Uh, I remember that I did like the dice pool building mechanics and uh, slot techniques and uh, slotting the dice in the new print match. I liked that idea and uh, I think it's pretty unique and. Uh, in my opinion, yeah, that's something that's really working for the game and uh, a good point is that you really have that mechanic which is uh, pretty unique. But that, how it happened, I don't remember uh, exactly the, the details of it, but I remember being puzzled at how the enemies moved, uh, how you moved their chips on the new print mat, and it didn't feel interesting for me. The type of the first version was that the tactical movement board was kind of useless. I, I actually beg to differ a bit because uh, I like how the game uh, the game uh, uses space. Uh, I, I have to say I only played the 2017 possibly 2017 version of Too Many Bonds, the original one. So it is like Alexis said, it has a bit of imperfection, especially on the strategic part, but we will go on that later. Uh, I have to say that I liked how the, the, the table space is a game uh, very compact. It can stay on a small table and you can still play and make significant moves on, on it. Yeah, that is, that is true. That's um, one of the fun aspects of the game. It's the... the... It's a lot smaller than you would assume, given the um i I think that the game is good, like I think that there's a lot of good ideas, so I don't want to be too negative about it, but um it it has some weird limitation in the way that it plays, for example, when you use a uh one of your skill dies, it's usually only a one you uh one of your skill dies, it's usually only a one use per battle and since it's a it's a die it's very often that you will just have a dud and instead of being able to cancel it or ignore it and roll it again uh, at another turn you just it's just wasted and roll it again uh, at another turn you just it's just wasted and since the game is usually pretty pretty short like through a campaign you're going to have like um 5 to 10 fights i think for the the longest one um sometimes you'll get a strong skill you'll get a strong skill towards the end of the game and you'll roll it twice and uh it might not even be useful uh, the two times especially since there's like there's a lot of um monsters that will have uh abilities that can cancel out uh your skills sometimes there's just Moments when you look at an, uh, a monster's abilities and you just feel like the the, the fight is you, not geared towards your your monsters. You, There's a... you know you, you kind of hit the nail in the head. Yeah. Uh, the, the the best part of this game is the dice mechanics because uh, building far, yeah. in your dice pool is the best thing of the game. And you can, uh, it's really strategic. I mean, uh, that, that you have long-term consequences for what you do. And uh, the, the bonds mechanic is a way to, to never completely waste a roll, which is a thing uh, that, that, that you always have in, uh, that, that, that you always have in these kind of games. When you roll bad, you are frustrated. And this game uh, basically uh, as a way to fix that but it does it better in expansions because i have to say this this game is probably the original version at least it's a style i have to say this this game is probably the original version at least it's a style to new players because uh, you have to know a bit how to build your character otherwise you you'll get an expensive skill you will never roll it and you're just accumulating bones turn after turn and that's you're just accumulating bones turn after turn and that's the a bit uh, of putting part let's say 
Yeah, it's definitely a bit of a, a an issue with the core game. I found my biggest problem, and this is a complaint I have about a lot of games, is if you release a core game, just have four characters. Have six. You've got to give people some options and choice because otherwise everyone might be like, I'm not very happy with, with any of these characters. Um, I don't really want to play. And a big part of Too Many Bones is you have to like the character. I, I, I don't really enjoy most of the core game characters outside of Boomer. Um, favorites are in the expansions. I, I really love Nugget. I love Gasket. Uh, the Lab Rats are, are immense fun. Uh, Stanza is amazing fun. Just a really silly character. Yeah. Um, Gilly is great too. G Gilly's very strong and fun. And it does feel like, again, this is a game where the more that they've designed... The, the better they've got at refining the good, better they've got at refining the good parts of everything. Like the interesting thing in Undertow is there's an ongoing campaign. So you can have your skills start to matter because you're building for this story up, these beats, not just one tyrant, but here we go, here we go. Let's follow the story of why, why Duster was in the situation of being, go, here we go. Let's follow the story of why, why Duster was in the situation of being thought to be a tyrant from the start. What's going on? And that's a nice, nice touch. I will say, though, one of the things really frustrating me the first time I played Undertow is you you have random day one and day two, and they're from four different options. There's a random day one and day two, and they're from four different options. There's a fight in each one. It's really awful if you hit the fight on day one and the fight on day two. It's, it's exhausting and it's tough because there, there's objectives on the day one fight where you've got to destroy two planks of wood otherwise mechs and they're three points and that's quite hard with two players to get those obstacles smashed because they have two health each and the attack dice on both duster and on stanza is they only have one attack dice to start with so you, you and you can't deploy nightshade immediately um duster has to be wounded before nightshade goes on the board the campaign progress on that is is great yeah I, I can imagine. That sounds like they went for something a lot more narratively interesting. Um, that's also something that I wanted to to touch about, is that the game is, uh, at least the, the base game, uh, is planned for four players, but it's supposed to be playable with less. And the problem is that I think that the balance of that is not super great, um, because having one less player on the board even if you lower the difficulties of the enemies that come in, uh, you still have a lot less action per turn and maneuverability, and still have a lot less action per turn and maneuverability. And some enemies feel uh, hardy, hardly uh, balanced for that. That's why uh, Undertow also got a lot of praise, because first of all, uh, it's planned for two players from the start, which um, means that they will they they two players from the start which um, means that they will they they thought about that uh, a lot more uh, i've not played it but that's what i've heard and i think that fen will confirm yeah yeah it's it's balanced for two players it also has its own separate solo adventure deck so if you play with one one gear lock yeah then it's different events. players we hit different um breakpoints with the the enemies the way that they they play it uh without going into details is that you have different pool of enemies that have different uh, numbers one five and twenty and in undertow they added three point baddies i think the number of player by by the the day that you are on and the thing is that uh if you have a fight to fight uh a fight against a monster 20 it's just going to be one monster 20 if there's four player it goes extremely fast unless you fall on the to one of the the really hard one but usually there uh, the problem is that if you are three players instead of having a number 20 you are going to have uh i don't know maybe uh 18 and 18 is going to be three number five and three number one and the problem is that that's a lot harder than just 120 and that's that's the that that's a lot harder than just 120 and that's that's the the general problem of the games that often you're going to find yourself against uh fights that feel a bit unbalanced um and i think that they did a better job in undertow adding a three points monster is also and i think that they did a better job in undertow adding a three points monster is also more interesting because um 
it avoids having just a crowded mat because if you have uh, four level ones on a on a mat, they can quickly crowd the one or two players. It's it's just in general um, better thought out. So Undertale is pretty good on that end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, there's uh, th there's another thing uh, which has to be mentioned that the game is kind of a bit fiddly to learn. I mean, you get your character mat, it is uh, uh, like an A4 uh, full, 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 full of text. So you, ca you can uh, either uh, try to learn everything and inevitably remember, remember uh, misremember something, or you can uh, try to learn as you play, and that part is not as incremental and one you always forget the tail which will which would have uh, changed the outcome of the scenario so uh, that is a bit complex but like I said I think that the, the the weakest point of the game is just that it's difficult to get in once you're in uh, this game is beautiful it's gorgeous it's a, it's a cheap tear beautiful uh, I, I, I just I, take as... care just take care because it's a cheap theory game not a yeah, cheap yeah. theory game. No, no, not a cheap. No. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, um, I, I on the, that, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that almost everything in this game is waterproof. Plastic cards. I think the rule book and the box of paper, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, I, I was impressed with the quality of the things. Even the printing on the dice felt uh, quality. And that, that, that's a very good point on the game. Uh, the neoprene material, I mean, you, you, if you uh, spread water on it or not, a point for durability of the that, game. That's kind of a mainstay of our chip theory game. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, I I was I used to be a kind of a poker chip collector myself. I have to say that the chips are beautiful. I I I, Nearly. I have always been I have always been a miniature guy, but I I I, Nearly. I have always been. I have always been a miniature guy, but I have to say I will always play a chip theory game. Actually, I'm more from Cloud Spire than this, but I have to say chip theory games are beautiful and chips are super cool. They but... certainly have a gimmick, but I, I just wanted to say games are beautiful and chips are super cool. They but... certainly have a gimmick, but I, I just wanted to say the health chips are way worse in quality than all the rest of the chips. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah. awful in comparison. Well, yeah. Fen, you can spend more money to get uh, the actual good quality health chip. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to say, I think that Roxley Games uh, made a Kickstarter for something, some po poker chips uh, which are beautiful, like 100 of them, 200 of them. I, I don't remember the name. Like uh, Clay something... Uh, anyway, Roxley Games uh, sells poker chips, uh, which are high quality, compared to the stuff from Chip Theory Games. But, cool. but in my opinion, all these materials, the neoprene and the chips, uh, which make the game uh, expensive. I mean, uh, compared to, if you took the same game with tokens and uh, cardboard uh, boards for the players, you it would be it much euros. for the players. You it could would make be it much. Less, yeah, it would be that. much less expensive and. Even though you feel that the durability is here, when we are in um, a time when people don't really play much of their games, I mean, it's known that uh, in, in general, of course, you always have ability is here. When we are in um, a time when people don't really play much of their games, I mean, it's known that uh, in, in general, of course, you always have these one or two favorite games that you play a lot, a lot, a lot. But I don't, I'm not sure uh, enough people, I mean, it's known that uh, in, in general, of course, you always have these one or two favorite games that you play a lot, a lot, a lot. But I don't, I'm not sure uh, enough people play these uh, chip, the, the, the chip theory games in general enough to make the price was the main reason, but uh, that would also be a reason why I wouldn't consider buying a game, because I think that for the same price I can get more gaming experience out of maybe two other games. I was going to say, it's definitely expensive and it's definitely not super environmentally friendly. You go, I don't need any more games. I've got too many bones now, which that's great for them if they enjoy this. Yeah. 
Yeah, th that's also the fact that uh, actually, if you just have the the base game, you can go only so much in the game. You have to buy expansions. That, that that's a thing. Of, uh, chip theory games. Uh, I'm thinking of Club Spire, where you want to get more factions to play. So. Uh, Actually, it's not just the game, it's uh, everything about the game. <laughs> um, just to, to finish building on what uh, Alessio was saying um, just before on the, the current, that's definitely uh, something that can get in the way. For example, I played Gasket, I think, when we played with Fen. Um, and I spent a good 10 minutes reading my uh, <laughs> my character sheet trying to understand exactly how the abilities function because it everything was, was, it was different. Tink. It was Tink. Guess gets <laughs> the mech, that's true. Uh, it was Tink, the, the character that creates uh, uh, mecha drones onto the battlefield. And it, it's very... I think it's one of the uh, the attractive aspects of the game is that each each character really plays differently and you, you really have are going to have... Um, an asymmetric are going to have um, an asymmetric gameplay with the different character, and that's where the game thrives in the the combos that you can make in between the, the different uh, character class that you can you can get into the game. Because if you play a game with well, uh, Tink, Gasket, and Gilly, it's going to the game. Because if you play a game with well. Uh, Tink, Gasket, and Gilly, it's going to be a very different game if you play it with, uh, let's say, Gilly, Pickett, and uh, Boomer, for example. It's The game really finds more replayability there, and that's that's where it, um, it really finds more replayability there, and that's that's where it, um, it works best, I think. But yeah, yeah. That's, um, that was too many bones. Um, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting game. And if you go with Undertow, uh, from what I've heard and from what Fen, Fen said, um, but it definitely takes some space onto the uh, onto your uh, table and budget uh, and budget, and uh, that's why uh, maybe you'll be more interested with a with a game that's uh, tiny and cheap. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> we're gonna go from throwing the bones all the way to skeletons hidden in the closet. Alessio, do tell us all about <laughs> yeah. micro macro crime city. Oh yeah, I'll talk about micro macro crime city, which is actually uh, the spiel the spiel des Jahres for this year. So well, everybody knows about it. and, and <laughs> that episode never came out. So yeah, uh, people need to know. So. Uh, yeah. This, this is basically uh, a deduction game, uh, although deduction is not exactly the word I'd use, but we will go there. Um, it's a game when, where you have a visual pass, a game happened in the aforementioned Crime City, a place where a lot of crimes of every kind will get perpetrated at every second of every waking hour, and not just every waking hour. And uh, you basically have cards uh, guiding you through the case and a solo game that you can play with others. Uh, it's actually a game which uh, allows for multiple players to be there because you have basically to find clues on the map, uh, to find the happenings of the map. And that's a cool part I will talk about uh, in just a second. Uh, multiplayer involvement in this game uh, in just a second. Uh, multiplayer involvement in this game is uh, actually not dissimilar to what you will play in multiplayer in an escape room game like Exit, okay, or just unlock or something like that. You just reason all together and find clues together. Yeah, I unlock or something like that. You just reason all together and find clues together. Yeah, I I'd say this one. Um, because of the map and because of like everything, I found it best actually at one or two players. Um, more players, it just kind of tends to get a bit messy around the table and hard to find everything. Messy around the table and hard to find everything. All um, those extra micro, extra micro, magnifying glasses do help. Yes. With, yeah. with, my, with my parents, we were four players, which was <laughs> enough to dedicate one player to reading the case. Yeah. A kind of I, DM. I, to, to li add a little bit on that, there's like a few cases when you need to find different things, and those are really fun with multiple players. 
Um, and I think that later, if they do expansion or more game, like um, Full House, if they do cases that specifically branches out, uh, they could be very interesting to play with. Uh, yeah, yeah, players. exactly. The, the, the game, the, the 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 beautiful thing of this game is just that the map is actually uh, evolving through time. I mean, you get uh, you get to a picture in the map, and that's a, a citizen like Mr. Cat doing business, doing his business. A map in the direction where Mr. Cat is walking, and you find Mr. Cat dead. Uh, that, that that's actually something that happened. It's like a visual novel that you have to to move. It's like a comic book without uh, the actual speech balloons. It uh, uh, I was uh, uh, defining like he, he playing this game feels a lot like reading Gone from Masashi Tanaka, uh, uh, which is that manga with the baby dinosaur where there's no speech balloon and stuff happens. You, uh, your deduction in this game is basically deducting what happened between panels, and you have no panels in, in the game. <laughs> so, uh, basically, uh, this, is, uh, this, this game is very smart. It's uh, great, and also it's a deduction game when you have to find evidence. This is, uh, I was going to say that this game find evidence. This is, uh, I was going to say that this game is a game like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is a game. I like a lot of deduction games. Uh, I have uh, three of the, I think, four boxes of social of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. I like the game. I think four boxes of social of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. I like the game, but I have to say, uh, sometimes in Sherlock Holmes uh, the deductions are far fetched. I'll always remember, and sometimes I want... <laughs> so, uh, a lot. Uh, uh, I I always I always uh, I'll always remember when you had to guess that the victim was hypnotized, and I won't say anything else because I don't remember the box where I mean, it is from. That's just like in the novels. <laughs> yeah. Well. Anyway. Any, anyway. Anyway. But I don't read the novels. You spoiled it for me. Yeah, a far-fetched tax aspect. I mean. No, no, I, I'm saying this so, so badly that it cannot be a spoiler. So uh, it's just that uh, in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, you are required to, to make a jump with your deduction, which is basically arbitrary. Yeah, in, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to like chime in on that. Games within this genre, I think Crime, uh, Crime City is like your nice introduction to this. Um, and Chronicles of Crime is very good. And my favourite of them is the most game-like uh, Detective City of Angels. But Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective has this wrinkle of... First of all, Sherlock Holmes' is, way it's worded is to make you feel like an idiot when he explains what's <laughs> yeah. going on. Some <laughs> I remember okay you already that. mentioned that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it, it is, yeah. It's, a, it's the biggest negative on the game. But the other thing is, if you sit and you follow through what how Sherlock Holmes deduces everything he is uh, able to make incredible leaps of deduction lucky wherever he goes the person is always there and and we've had cases where we've tried to find someone and we've gone to two three places where they thought they might be and then then they turn out to be somewhere else that we knew of but we didn't know they'd be there and that's that's frustrating itself what i like about this is when you solve a case micro macro crime city makes you feel makes you feel smart for solving it which is nice yeah, actually, th that's it. The, the the good thing about Micro Macro is that you actually uh, get evidence for the stuff that's happening. You are not just satisfied with guessing what happened. You have to find evidence of that, and that's super cool. The bad part of it, you have to find evidence of that, and that's super cool. The bad part of this is sometimes even the the, the most uh, difficult cases in the 16 uh, cases box the the questions are basically gu guiding you through the answer so uh, the the questions are basically gu gu guiding you through the answer so uh, basically uh, you could be smarter uh, you could guess stuff uh, earlier but you have to follow the cards so are you you are guided uh, anyway th to to the solution which is fine but it's a bit limiting like fan yeah. said it's an introduction yes it, 
it happened to us a couple of times when we we played the game uh going through the the, the cards well, well turning over a card and then looking at the board for like five minutes and finding maybe the next two steps in the case as we just and then when we turned the cards the question was had already been answered i'd say it's not too big of a problem i would i would say like when you start a case like investigate it truly and try to first find as much as you can about it and then go through the cards and see if you can find more um there's a there's one case about someone having been uh, killed by a bow uh and i i would recommend people to like just start the case and not even look through the cards but uh examine the 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 place where that person was killed and then try to walk it out by yourself where that person was killed and then try to walk it out by yourself and you might even be able to uh finish the case without turning over the cards and whenever you don't you feel like you don't know what you're looking for when you are stuck then you can go back to the cards i think that works best um can go back to the cards i think that works best um like the first card is always interesting as a way to know where to start but then then just try to do it by yourself because the game is is really smart and the the map is beautiful and sometimes while looking looking at an other case you might get clues later um i think it's a i think it's a great game on that end i was definitely shocked by the fact that the game looks so nice and friendly and and kid uh like kid friendly and actually there's uh, a lot of murders and oh uh, stuff gets very that. very gr- <laughs> um a, a character is getting um uh blackmailed for for being an homosexual by uh another character that's some type of weird bigot but it, it's just it's really weird in in some places uh i i also say um Maybe look through the cases. Th- before thank- playing it with your yeah. kids. Yeah, thankfully I got you covered here. So, uh, mm-hmm. a bit of the content treated here. Missing people, road rage, homosexuality, murder in various forms, implied blackmail, implied extortion, BDSM, secret societies, bigotry, <laughs> and... Gangs. Yeah. <laughs> so, basically, the, the the game has a lot of dark content, which is not, not all cases are appropriated for kids. And uh, this is not properly uh, highlighted in the box of the game, at least in the... First. You get a very, uh, a very informative uh, uh, va- uh, kind of... Uh, uh, chart uh, detailing the difficulty and the uh, age appropriateness of each case which uh, in hindsight should be in the core game box but it's a cool thing to know that exists yeah i was just gonna say even though they're doing that you can still have like if you've played this with the younger players they're gonna see stuff on the map that they're gonna have questions about yep. so it's 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 tough i don't yeah this is hard I, to I, it's, it's it's tough i don't yeah this is hard I, to i would say this is yeah. a game for like 14 plus 14 15 it's probably yeah <laughs> more appropriate at that age um rather than you know don't don't play that with your 10 year old yeah because you uh, since the visual you know don't don't play that with your 10 year old yeah because you uh, since the visual puzzle is there you can always have your sight uh, drop uh, on something you shouldn't if you're playing with kids so that's it Uh, or if you do play with your kids be prepared to answer some (laughs) sorry in the the meantime uh, fan is posting uh, pictures of uh, f8 crimes (laughs) in the map (laughs) so Uh, neither of these crimes i'm particularly thrilled about yeah, <laughs> there's also implied rape in uh, in the list of cases. Uh, I... So and and I think if you look on the map, there are some crimes that you see, but we if you do, you don't have cases related to that. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Those are supposed to be um like uh how do you, how do you call that again? Uh, red red the herrings. No. Red, red, red herrings. Red herring, yeah. 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 Um. Anyway. 
uh, all of this has been taken into account because this game is getting a sequel. I think it's due by the end of the year, uh, Container Crisis and other stuff uh, allowing it. And the cardboard uh, <laughs> uh, supply issues. Uh, allowing it. And the cardboard uh, <laughs> uh, supply issues. And uh, the the new form of uh, bi biblical plague, uh, which will eat us uh, in the end of the year. Anyway, <laughs> there will be its uh, in the works. Okay? <laughs> there will be its uh, in the works. Actually, almost complete uh, sequel a sequel to this game, which is called Micro Macro Crime City Full House. Uh, which is uh, basically not just uh, more of the same, but it promises to deliver as skins with a multiplayer and uh, uh, a differentiation, and uh, we will see how it's done, uh, for, uh, uh, for kids. Basically, you will have uh, age-appropriate cases uh, for a lot of age ranges. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to... You can see why it's, it won its awards. It's a pretty um, interesting game. It's a unique spin on an existing genre, which is always a good thing to take some previous mechanics, reiterate them, and make it different. I mean, visual. So that's uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's colorblind friendly. It's this. It's, it has a lot of good things going for it with a simple yet very smart mechanic. This is a game one should try, if not at least have... Uh, but it's a thing that uh, uh, will give a unique perspective to this kind of deduction games. Uh, this is an introduction uh, game. And it's very, very. Um, one thing that I will also uh, say about about this uh, is that the price point is uh, twenty euros um, when it was available. Uh, right now, there's there's a shortage of the game because it uh, won so many awards. And I think that's great. That's that's just what I would want from a game like this because there's only 16. I think you can download a few more. Okay. Uh, you you I'm can not go, sure about it. You can go through the um, uh, through the cases pretty quickly, uh, and 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 once you go you went through them, well, the game is probably not going to be played much more until you have other much more until you have other friends around or. Uh, until some time passes, uh, but at 20 euros, I think that's perfectly fine. It's like a, the price of uh, a couple of uh, cinema tickets. I think that's that's a good price point. I would. It not... doesn't make two movie tickets where I live. <laughs> price point. I would. It not... doesn't make two movie tickets where I live. <laughs> it's less than two movie tickets. No, uh... I actually, I have to say that the price point is. Uh spot on i would have uh, probably spent less on cards since they are not that have uh, probably spent less on cards since they are not that important except uh, for flipping and i would have used the money to make a real uh, magnifying glass because the the refracting lenses are smart but they are terrible to look at big stuff yeah. Yeah. Uh, the refracting lenses are smart, but they are terrible to look at big stuff. Yeah. Well, at 20 euros, you're not really wasting much yeah. money. And it does take more space on the table than too many bones, even though it takes way less shelf yes. space. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a table. It takes way less shelf yes. space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely a table eater for sure. But uh, we get to talk about now one that isn't. I just have to kind of push things on, I'm afraid, because uh, we got to go and put away those spy glasses and get back to the ivory. So, Audrey, do tell us all about this small, light-hearted card and dice game. Ivories. So, Audrey, do tell us all about this small, light-hearted card and dice game called One Deck Dungeon. Yes, One Deck Dungeon is a card game for one to two players uh, designed by Chris Cheslik Chies uh, and published by Asmadi Games. Uh, the game is, as its name says, a dungeon that's built from one deck. You have one deck of cards, a few extra large cards for the character sheets, and that's it. You have everything you need to play that. A few, a few tokens, of course, and a nice uh, stack of dice. But 
the dungeon itself is it's a game for one to two players but the idea is mostly to play it with two players that's a bit more fun and you pick each player picks a character sheet so you will have the classic tropes of uh, fantasy dungeons except that all the characters are ladies they are all fighting like some enemies are guys but not the, uh, the protagonists so each player picks one finds the different statistics, get the dice corresponding to the statistics. So the dice have colors corresponding to the statistics. You have the yellow dice for the strength, uh, the blue for the intelligence uh, arcana, and the, ye uh, the oops, black dice, which are uh, special dice. You constitute your pool based on the number of symbols of each color that are on the character uh, sheet, and you are ready to explore the dungeon. How do dungeons play? You take four of the cards of a dungeon, put them together, and at a time you will turn one to see what's hiding behind because the back of the cards are doors. So you will open the door. Every time you open a door, you discard two cards that remain in the pile uh, of the dungeon. Every time you set up uh, the, the, the doors, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, of the dungeon. Every time you set up uh, the, the, the doors, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, that's how you have a time um, mechanics, which says that you will exhaust the pile and not go through every single card, which is the thing that makes every mechanics, which says that you will exhaust the pile and not go through every single card, which is the thing that makes every single dungeon a bit unique. In order, of course, you will encounter monsters of level 1, monsters of level 2, monsters of level 3. When you turn the cards, the cards will, will have squares with colors, which correspond to the dice colors, with numbers inside and symbols. Then you will roll the dice, and you have to cover the squares with dice that have a number higher than what's written. So for instance, if you have a square we, which is yellow and with a hourglass or a heart, if uh, one square isn't covered, you will suffer from this. So the heart, which are when a character takes wounds, and the hourglass, which is when you discard cards from the dungeon pile. So it means basically that you're taking too much time to fight the monster. Penalties do we suffer because sometimes you will have one dice and you will be able to put it into two different squares. So, oh, which square do we select? You can use uh, the abilities of the characters. They all have uh, two different abilities. And the, with these abilities, you can help your friend reroll a dice, get a black extra dice, uh, two different abilities. And the, with these abilities, you can help your friend reroll a dice, get a black extra dice. You can also combine two of your dice, for example, a pink three and uh, a blue four to make a black three and a black you can be put into any square. And so you will have lots of and uh, a blue four to make a black three and a black you can be put into any square. And so you will have lots of combos. Once a monster is killed, you have three different choices of what to do with it. Uh, use it to get XP, which will help you uh, get higher level. With a higher level, you can with a higher level you can get more skills. You can get more uh, uh, stats. The second possibility is to use the monster card to increase your skills or your stats because they have all each single monster has some stats symbols and a skill. So level one, you have the ability to add a second uh, extra skill under your character and a second extra start extra start uh, card under your character so you you have to choose every single time a monster is killed what to do with it because at some point every single character will have one card speed but at the start you might say mm, i like this skill but i also like the stat so what do i do and also not two runs uh, are really the same there, are, there is always something different to do and that, that, that's something that is very interesting because uh, uh, as Micro Micro Crime City, it's a game which has uh, a very good mileage uh, out of it. And that's not even counting the expansion because that's another spending uh, moment, but you get more mileage again. 
And I think that's something that's really interesting is that, yeah, you, you can do really um, very different experiences and the setup of the game is pretty fast. Oh, I, um, I got to say, this is one of the games I own twice. I own um, all of the physical stuff and I own all of it again as the app because this is such a good, like, idle time game for when I'm waiting for things to dry or whatever. I can just pop on and do a quick run. And this is a great game for taking on holidays. So small. Um, and do a quick run and this is a great game for taking on holidays so small um i also wanted to say i love this so much the artwork in this game is wonderful and every single character is like a appropriately adventuring dressed yeah yes. love it so good yeah so and good. yeah yes. love it so good yeah so unfortunately good. rare yeah, very, very rare. Uh, all the characters are very positive, very cool looking badass. And I love the roguelike mechanics in this, where when you complete a run, you get a few pips you can put towards on a little character sheet. And you can bring that same character. Complete a run, you get a few pips you can put towards on a little character sheet. And you can bring that same character out in the future and maybe unlock some new skills or stats for them and do harder and harder difficulty dungeons. It's uh, really interesting. Yeah. It's it's a really fun game. Uh, it's it's also really compact. It's a perfect game, fun game. Uh, it's it's also really compact. It's a perfect game to bring along when you are traveling. Uh, I think that they they really nailed it. Um, yeah. yeah, I heard that the concept of the game was uh, asked from the daughter of the creator. I don't know if it's a new band legend. I doubt a bit about it. I creator. I don't know if it's a new band legend. I doubt a bit about it. I don't remember exactly. But uh, if that's the case, that's something great that we have uh, this kind of uh, game for to show and to say this is what we want to see. Yeah, I, I unabashedly love One Deck Dungeon, and I adore how it gives you a really compact dungeon crawling experience and scales the monsters in a very intelligent way as well. The variation for each dungeon, the way that the dungeon levels, um, the difficulty increase is printed on the back of the monster you're going to face at the end. You rack things up and sometimes traps get harder. Uh, sometimes monsters, you know, are the ones that get way harder. It's ooh, it, It's wonderful. And all those skill combos from combining different characters together and the way they interact is interesting to learn. Yeah, I also liked um, if, uh, with Venix, which really says, oh, you, you have a timer that's running. And if you open a door and say, mm, nope, we're not going there, you are losing time. Yeah. And even, even if you go back to that door later, that time will still be lost. Yeah, and also... On top of that, sometimes, like when you encounter the traps, you have a choice of a harder. You have a choice of a harder check, or with a higher punishment for failing, or an easier check. But you have to spend extra time to do that check, which is yeah. really cool. Yeah, but, but that's a very cool mechanic, and I, I, it does feel really like uh, a dungeon. Like you have a DM which says, "Oh, okay, now you are uh, a dungeon." Like you have a DM which says, oh, okay, now you encounter this. What do you do? And you have to say what you do. It feels a bit like that to me. Oh, yeah, it feels like that to me as well. And uh, it also feels like an exceptional example of good compact design in every way. It's so, so well done. Yeah. Compact design in every way. It's so, so well done. Yeah, the cards are full with information, but you can't misread it. It's clear. It's and there's also uh, a conversion uh, on Android and PC that works extremely well. It's so. Um, I would I would recommend anybody to if they don't pick the the board game version to pick the the Android or the PC version. It's on Switch as well. Uh, even more than. Whoa, that's interesting actually. <laughs> Pick your video uh, game the support for. Have you played the expansion, by the way? Yeah, I have. Um, I've got all of the expansions. I've got the one that adds the Fiend, which is like a modifier monster that tracks you through the entire dungeon. A couple of extra characters, including a fairy. If she takes any damage, you lose the game. Um, she has some mechanics to counter that. Mechanics to counter that. Um, and then Forest of Shadows, which 
adds a whole bunch of extra characters, a new dungeon deck that you can either play by itself or mix with the original, and includes a poison mechanic, which works just as you'd expect poison to do. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's the same size box again. Um, I'm really happy that uh, everything fits with the cards. The same size box again. Um, I'm really happy that uh, everything fits with the cards sleeved up. Like there's, it's it's just they they thought very carefully about what to do with the design of these. And yeah, they're so. I I sometimes complain about board games selling you air. One deck dungeon doesn't sell you any. I I sometimes complain about board games selling you air. One Deck Dungeon doesn't sell you any air. They, they sell you nothing but sheer excitement and thrill and dice rolling. And sometimes it doesn't fit back in properly until you adjust everything. Yeah, I just checked the description in Board Game Geek for uh, One Deck Dungeon Forest of Shadows. The dice chucking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that poison really does change things quite a bit. It's, it's interesting. Okay, well, um, I think that takes us through One Deck Dungeon and... Now we're going to go from those dark depths uh, and instead travel to behind the dark and drawn curtains of a very tense situation. Now, um, I've been wanting to talk about this one for a while. Uh, it's just recently become the hottest thing and sold out entirely because Hostage Negotiator Korea came out. Um, this game is a solo player card game which also uses dice where you take the role. It's a very sleek production very cleverly done and um, what you're going to do is you set up your board you have a abductor there's three in the base game three in crime wave and you can buy up to like 10 extras in other um, booster packs and uh, dice these dice only have a one in three chance of success and then a another result where you have to discard two cards to get a success so this odds are stacked against you per dice which is by design, you're meant to sit down and get other cards. And that's where the nice mechanic of conversation points come in. So sometimes you'll, you'll have to buy them again, but they will give you more powerful effects, like improve your chances of success, or maybe get the abductor to release a hostage, or even if you get far enough down to just get the abductor to stand down entirely, or you take order a sniper to take the abductor out. Um, it is a... Um, it is a very well done thematic game. The dice do a good job of making you feel like the situation isn't always in your control, which is, I've not myself been a hostage negotiator. I have done a lot of official interviews on behalf of a government. And sometimes you've done a lot of official interviews on behalf of a government. And sometimes you think the conversation's all fine. And OK, and then suddenly the other person just goes off and you're like, whoa, I didn't know this was bubbling underneath. OK, we've got a problem now. We need to deal with this. And the dice capture that wonderfully. Um, there are two versions. Wonderfully. Um, there are two versions of a core game that you can get. You can get the original Hostage Negotiator um, and you, or you can get Crime Wave. Hostage Negotiator is cheaper. Crime Wave is better. And I will talk a little bit about that, but I think Alexis, you've played one of these, haven't you? Yeah, uh, I played the base uh, three players at the do three uh, uh, hostage uh, taker at the start. It, it has a male negotiator. That's Mike. Yes, yes. Um, I I played it a while ago because I I was looking for a solo player game to at the start of the pandemic. Um, it was very interesting. What I liked is that. Um, while it kind of feel like a deck building game or like a pool building game, even though you reset your pool at every turn, um, what you really need to what really need to what's really important is that every uh, every situation is more like a puzzle more than a, a deck building game because they every that you're going to to interact with uh, I'm going to call them boss because it makes more sense uh, in my head uh, I'm going to call them boss because it makes more sense uh, in my head every boss that you interact with is going to have a different uh, way to function and they each are going to have different uh, demands uh, that yeah. are randomly yeah. uh, driven and the thing is that if you want to see yeah. randomly uh, driven 
And the thing is that if you want to succeed, you are going to have to play with that. Some of them even have a special rule. Uh, I really liked one of the the last one from the the, the box set that does not kill hostages. Yeah. You, unless... you mean yeah, you mean Edward Quinn, obviously the one that Rado didn't want to go up against because he said he felt like the guy was like a good guy and he, he understood what what he was doing. And people have said to Rado, maybe you should have played that scenario and seen how it played out because it's it's pretty interesting. It's uh, it, it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I have a very different way to approach them. And like, for example, uh, one of them wants gun, and if you give them give him gun, uh, every next uh, interaction is going to be a lot harder. But if you do it right before the the last few hostages are taken out, you can use that. You can use that to then um, to then pay for let's say a sniper team to, to to take him out just at that moment and that that's really fun and dense and you always feel worried when rolling dice it does feel like the dice always feel worried when rolling dice it does feel like the dice uh hated me through the uh my entire run yeah of the game. that's the same um, impression i had <laughs> Yeah. That's the way they're designed. Yeah, you're not yeah, supposed yeah. to like rolling those dice. You meant to feel like they're against you. Yeah, uh, they, they they are definitely. Uh, it's it's de feel like they're against you. Yeah, uh, they 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 are definitely. Uh, it's it's definitely a hard game, but it's a very fun and interesting one. And I was looking at uh, career because I'd love to play it. Um, and uh, and I'm glad that you're you're going to give us uh, your impression of it. Yeah, I am. So uh, touch on the uh, abductors in the two core games, and then on the extra packs, just to give you an idea, because some of them are essential for career, some of them are optional extras, um, and there are some really really good ones as well. Uh, so in I'd say in the original hostage negotiator, the three hostage abductors are kind of. They're very much training you to learn how the system works. Um, Arcane, uh, Arcane Masu um, is a, I believe, a French-Canadian terrorist, which is kind of unusual in itself, kind of a safe way to play a terrorist. Hey! <laughs> hey, hey. Daka! No, no, I was going to say, normally Canada, Canadians aren't considered, to, you know, there's not terrorist problems in Canada, so... Which is why I just said Tabernacle. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. There's, there's, so, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff boiling below Canadians. <laughs> Well, it's also worth remembering that all of these are very inspired by the film idea of this. And it's worth remembering that all of these are very inspired by the film idea of this. And there is some relation to the real stuff. It's obvious that AJ Porfino did his research before creating this stuff. But, uh, you know, tongue in cheek, don't take it too seriously. The second one's Donna, who is a professor who's been passed over. Don't take it too seriously. The second one's Donna, who is a professor who's been passed over for tenure. Um, she's she doesn't actually really want to kill anyone. She's just kind of like gone a bit off, you know, like a, a bit too far. Um, I don't much care for the artwork of her. I think it's a pretty bad um, portrayal. Um, she, she went postal. Doesn't go postal though. She she teaches yeah. you about how to save hostages. She's basically one or two steps above the area where you can save hostages, and you're taught how to. They call it um, soothe and save which is get her down to the safe period, soothe her some more, and she will just let hostages go. So that's her point. And then Alexis mentioned the best one of the stuff. He's, he's in a hospital, and he's, his son is, is need, needs, direly needs medical care. And this is like a, a statement about the American health system. It's pretty interesting on that front. Um, and, and he, again, he's not really like looking to kill people. He's not he, a bad he does, person. He does uh, unless uh, things go horribly wrong. Yeah, you kind of have to push him in that position. And actually, you can resolve everything very peacefully just by building up conversation points to give in to his demand, which is give my son medical care. And he just gives in. And that's like a very nice depiction to see these three different characters gives in. And that's like very nice depiction to see these three different characters in uh, very different ways. Like Arcane is very just like cardboard cutout villain. Um, yeah, he's the villain from um, 
uh, Die Hard. Yeah, he, no, no, he's not. He's he's from Twenty Four, and I'll tell you why <laughs> not when I get uh, Die Hard. Yeah, he, no, no, he's not. He's he's from Twenty Four, and I'll tell you why <laughs> not when I get to them because there are villains from Die Hard in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the Pedersen twins. They are absolutely the Pedersen twins. Yeah, I, I thought Nakatomi Plaza all all over. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, but but Crime Wave has um three other abductors, and um. Barrett Millens is basically your stereotypical angry man who's angry at everything. Um, and he's actually a bit of a teddy bear underneath it all. Um, it's, he's, considering how simple he is, he's very interesting to play. Uh, and you've also got uh, Renisha Sharp, who's a, a hostage from another gang. She has some interesting demands. She basically... Um, there's, there could have been more to her. I think that she's more interesting than the first three, but still not one of the best. Um, and there is also, oh, well, there's, um, there's one who rhyme wave abductors. There's one more to find, and I'm not going to give away anything about who they are and what they do. Um, but it is probably the second best abductor in the entire lot and really good. And that's part of the reason I think crime wave is the recommendation, but also crime wave is random. There's a disgruntled CEO who tries to take control of conversation all the time. There's um, the Pedersen twins we already mentioned. One of them's quite reasonable, but if you eliminate him, his brother is off the rails and will just like really make your life miserable. Um, there's a, a police lieutenant who's like, hey, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Like, so she's like a, a, an influencer. And so she's very sort of like silly with what she's doing. She's not taking it serious until suddenly halfway through the game when you get like a number of the hostages out suddenly she starts panicking realizing this is a serious situation um but uh the best one for me is essential for korea you have to own her and you have to own crime wave and the original hostage negotiator to be able to play and she's a hostage negotiator who has gone off the rails and so all your tricks don't work or they work once or she goes no you're not doing that and it's a great little cat and mouse back and forth yeah really not doing that and it's a great little cat and mouse back and forth yeah really of course i'm not going to go near the wind do you think i'm silly yeah or i heard so i know that trick you're just stalling for time get yeah, forget about it she just takes your tools away all of that leads into uh hostage negotiator career and that's fascinating because what to uh hostage negotiator career and that's fascinating because what van rider games have done is they built this core system and the first three hostage abductors are interesting, but they kind of teach you the game. Then in Crime Wave, they set things up a bit better. The, the hostage hostage mechanics are more interesting. Um, but it's when you get to the expansion packs that the really interesting uh, cases occur. And every single one's like a puzzle. You've got to have a plan. You've got to get in there and make your decisions about what you're handling when it's time to step back and just trade cards in for conversation points and just roll with the punches or when it's time to go for that career takes all of those puzzles and asks you okay so you're gonna do a campaign of multiples you're gonna play one career of this of this hostage negotiator your your choice of hostage negotiator and Along the way, the consequences of each case are going to build. You lose hostages total over the campaign, it's over, you lose. Um, and you will... It, it's, it's like a kind of a, a silly, classic, American crime drama type thing. You know, like NCIS and, and NSI and all of those. Very sort of tongue-in-cheek silliness. And NSI and all of those. Very sort of tongue-in-cheek silliness. You'll encounter one of the abductors in a dream before you face them and all of those kind of things. But it builds up wonderfully because all of the things you do, the consequences matter. If you fail, um, it do. The consequences matter. If you fail, um, it, it, it builds on the story. And so that's OK. You haven't lost the campaign. You can keep going. Uh, and that's fascinating and the way that they lace Valerie Stone into it is is really wonderful and interesting. Um, so it, it, it builds in the way that I feel. It reminds me in some ways, and I often make this comparison, I shouldn't, but in this case I think it's true. It reminds me of playing a campaign of Kingdom Death because you are facing a bunch of different individual personalities 
in each case, you're asked to work out what works against each one. Um, and the solution maker is going to behave the same way. In fact, they won't. And as you do that, whether you win or fail, that builds on the story of your of your campaign and events and you'll get bonuses for some stuff or you'll get a cat and it'll tear up your furniture or you'll get a dog and it'll uh, run away, you know, or you'll have problems with your spouse. Fascinating that they took the systems and didn't mess with them and just added a bunch of little extra decks, little extra mechanics and turned a good game that's an interesting puzzle that sometimes is very frustrating into something where the failures are still not the end. And I thought that's great. Failures are still not the end. And I thought that's great. Yeah, it does sound really great. I've been interested in Carrier for a while, and it definitely sounds like a great variation on the game. And uh, I, I definitely might uh, try to, to grab it. Yeah, it's just not an easy ask because you've got to have hostage. Try to, to grab it. Yeah, it's just not an easy ask because you've got to have Hostage Negotiator and you've got to have Crime yep. Wave and you've got to have at least, I think, Valerie Stone and ideally you want a load of other abductor packs as well. So at this point you're looking at $150, which for some people might not be a problem. It's nice that you can buy it a bit at a time, um, time um, but that is a lot for a purely solo game that you could play two-player if you wanted to work with your partner or one other person. Um and make the decisions together, but it's not really a co-op game uh, at all. And yeah, I picked up the extra meeples. I've got the um, neoprene mat to help organize everything. Um, Ooh, it's it's the full and every, Yeah, everything fits into one box really well, which is great. That makes it nice and easy to transport around. Um, and definitely it's been nice seeing them improve on this from one step to the next. Yeah. I'm the system and they're doing a series called Final Girl. Uh, the Kickstarter hasn't like delivered yet, so we're still waiting to see what's going on. But in essence, it's using this same mechanical system of cards and dice, but you play the final girl from a horror movie. Um, okay. And 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 people have said uh, that it's that, uh, who've had a chance to, okay. and 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 people have said uh, that it's that, uh, who've had a chance to demo it or play it have said it's really good, like a huge huge set of improvements over Hostage Negotiator, which is already a good system. Yeah, so. I, I didn't play the, the game, but uh, I watched a few videos and stuff like that. And I really liked the game, but uh, I watched a few videos and stuff like that. And I really liked uh, the layout of the board and stuff. You, you have everything fitting, uh, everything has clear graphics, etc. So I, I think there's also a visual conception of the game, which is great. Yeah, there is. Um, you've reminded me. I didn't even talk about the terror deck. Talk about the terror deck, which uh, that's has its own laid out space, and it is a. It's like the epidemic cards from, or like the you know the event cards from any cooperative game, where you draw one after you've done stuff, and some strange stuff happens. Mm. And the terror deck sometimes helps you quite often, like harms you and the abductor are, which means it's good to find out those demands quickly, but then you have to think about those and whether you want to concede them. Don't concede letting them have a bus, by the way. They'll just leave. Um, and uh, it, the really cool part of this, right at the end, there's one final terror event, which escalates up to, like, buy cards repeatedly during your turn. Normally you can only buy them at the end of the turn, and you can just keep going and keep going. It represents, like, that last desperate kind of movie moment where the hostage negotiator is trying to do everything they can to to get a good resolution. Um, mm. And it's 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 got a great pacing through this entire thing. I, I guess it's got a great pacing through this entire thing. I, I guess say Van Ryder Games, anything they make these days, I think I'm going to take a good look at it. Because they, they're fantastic at thematic games. For sure, yeah. Now they they, they definitely seem uh, pretty great. Yeah. Now they they, they definitely seem uh, pretty great. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is uh, I as I say, I own two of their games, and they're both like knockouts within their category for me. Hostage Negotiator. Just, I was uncomfortable with the subject matter initially. Then I realized that this was more of a like movie. Then I realized that this was more of a like movie depiction, and I was like, okay, I can get behind that. Uh, uh, they also picked the um, interesting uh, 
abductors. Is that how they call them? Um, yeah, uh, they, they also picked interesting, make them make sense. Like the either they are clearly movie villains or they, you know, you have to build a relationship and they are, you know, not terrible people like the, the uh, Quinn, for example. I think that they, they did a good job in not just um, we of some stereotypes of something. I think that they always try to do some f- stuff that is interesting. Yeah, I agree. I I think they they've used this game to save some stuff about the country that they live in. Yeah. Uh, for sure and how things are and it is it's certainly interesting to solve the Okay. Well, I think that's everything we have to say about Hostage Negotiator and that was our last game of the podcast. And with that final shot, that is all we have time for this episode. Thank you for listening to The Last Standee. You can catch us over at www.patreon.io. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye from Audrey. Bye-bye. And myself. And remember that the second E in Standee is for enormity. Enormity.